And I pushed continue, I guess I did that anyhow. Okay, excellent. Yeah. We'll just give it a, another minute or so. I have the book here if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> oh, excellent. Actually, I'll go ahead and, um, hi everyone. I am going to share the link to the book with the crowd. Let me go ahead and start. Welcome everyone to the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you're safe from the winter storms. And today we'll be discussing Hong Kong and its democracy movement and its relationship with China. Our speaker is Michael Davis, a visiting professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia University and professor of law and international affairs at OP Jindal Global University in India. He won a 2014 Human Rights Press Award for commentary and today we'll be discussing his new book, Making Hong Kong China. I'm going to paste information about the book into the chat so that you have it. He also has a copy available here. If you have any questions during his talk, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get to them during Q&A. For Stanford CDDRL affiliates, if you're interested in asking your question directly, please let me know that and indicate it in the Q&A box when you ask your question. Without further ado, let me turn things over to Professor Davis. Uh, thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, I uh, appreciate uh, this invitation, a chance to talk about Hong Kong. Of course, I wrote the book that, with the ambition of uh, trying to make information about Hong Kong, perhaps a little deeper information available to people. Uh, the Hong Kong stories, I think, can be interesting to people in your center, whether they're Hong Kong specialists or not. It, in some ways, it almost looks like a textbook case of how to suppress the press uh, and, uh, and uh, the media and discussion in general. It essentially looks like uh, if, a, if a leaders wanted to uh, destroy a liberal constitutional system, then this would be the way they might do it. Uh, the liberal system we're gonna talk about and the book uh, introduces is the, the one in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong uh, in 1984 and then uh, implemented in 1997 was promised a high degree of autonomy. Uh, the common law system was to be maintained in Hong Kong, human rights and basic freedoms were guaranteed. The courts were independent and final. Uh, the system created in Hong Kong actually was quite stunning. And over many years, Hong Kong would be often ranked as the freest society in the world. Uh, and uh, in other ways, its constitutional system, its rule of law was very highly regarded. And this is somewhat extraordinary because it wasn't fully a democracy. The basic law that was enacted under the treaty turning Hong Kong back to China uh, provided that the ultimate aim would be universal suffrage, but this, this aim was never achieved. In fact, I, I would say if there were two flaws in the Hong Kong system, they, they really go back to the origin. And one was that China retained the right to, to decide uh, cases involving the basic law, to interpret the basic law. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, you know, exclusively a right in the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Uh, the courts could interpret the basic law within Hong Kong's autonomy, but if anything came up involving uh, local central relations or Ch China's or Hong Kong's autonomy, uh, you know, the, it's a relationship with the central government, then they were to refer the matter to, this, to the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Now, I'd written a book in 1989 in which I suggested that one way to handle this autonomy arrangement would have been to have the courts, uh, you know, th that the courts could refer this to a, a committee or a constitutional court that would be equally made up of Hong Kong and mainland participants. And, and this is a kind of model that's used around the world when you have autonomy arrangements and you want to make sure the central government doesn't overwhelm the autonomous community. And, and the basic law committee was created, but then it was made completely subordinate to the central government. Uh, and in fact, it's functioned over the years more or less in secret, 
Uh, there's no open hearings before the basic law committee, and it doesn't have the power to decide. So that, that suggestion was not taken up. So one of the flaws in the Hong Kong model is that. The other one is that the uh, basic law promised, as I mentioned a moment ago, universal suffrage for Hong Kong, that that would be the ultimate aim. And the central government, because it has the power to, to interpret and decide, uh, has drug its feet over this promise of democracy. So this has resulted in a problem, which I think is quite interesting, that the people of Hong Kong have long understood that if their autonomy was going to be secure, that they would need to have a government locally answerable to Hong Kong people. And so autonomy arrangements, uh, in effect, I would say, depend on this. If the local government is merely subordinate to the central government, then there's no autonomy. And we know in China, there's all kinds of arrangements uh, promised to ethnic and national minorities that should be autonomy. But because uh, the government is appointed by the central government, this autonomy is never realized. And this has been a problem for Hong Kong. And this, the protest on the streets of Hong Kong that have taken place over the years, and most notorious, I suppose, in 2019, uh, involve, you know, at certain level, a demand for democracy because Hong Kong people understand that their autonomy is not secure without democracy. Uh, and so uh, over the many years, there have been protests in 2003 and four, there have been protests in 2014 and 15, these massive protests demanding democracy, I think in many ways are really the Hong Kong people speaking out on their autonomy and rule of law. They understand that without a government that answers to the local people, the government will not defend their autonomy and without autonomy, the rule of law will not be preserved. And this is quite important because uh, without the, this rule of law and the rule of law, I should say is generally ranked in uh, opinion polls in Hong Kong as the most important core value. And without the rule of law, then the mainland system can overwhelm Hong Kong. And so this was kind of at the heart of the concern in the massive protest in 2019. In the book, I outline all of these different things. And regarding the protest, I actually went to Hong Kong and did a range of interviews in regard, actually, we were working on a report on Hong Kong. And I use a lot of this research also in the book. Uh, and the 2019 protest, the people, the protest we know was started around a demand uh, that an extradition law that the Hong Kong government was proposing not be uh, implemented, not be enacted. Uh, and, and in fact, eventually that, that extradition law was withdrawn in the face of massive protest. It took a few months for that to happen, but it did happen. <clears throat> but during these protests, uh, the, the way the government enforced uh, its uh, you know, security, I guess it is public order in Hong Kong, uh, involved a rather heavy crackdown by police. Uh, and so as things ensued, uh, people added to the demands that the police be in the, their, their behavior be investigated, that their characterization of the protest as riots uh, be withdrawn and so on. And most importantly, they demanded that the promised democracy be carried out. So this is, has been, uh, again, as I say, a driving force behind all these different protests. And so as we know from the reports, the protests in Hong Kong in 2019 were massive. Uh, there was a lot of confrontation between police and the protesters. Some uh, hotheads, of course, in the protest side were throwing rocks and bricks and so on. And the police were using heavy handed methods such as uh, you know, rubber bullets, uh, tear gas and other things uh, rather aggressively uh, to quell the protest. Lots of arrests were made, over 10,000 before it was all over. Uh, 2,000 and some, I forget, about a quarter of, of those arrested have been prosecuted so far. But the, the prosecutions in Hong Kong seem to come up every now and then uh, rather surprisingly. We know right this week there's a, a prosecution of 15 of the sort of elders of the democracy movement uh, over their participation in a protest in August of 2019. 
And so uh, why were they targeted? Many people believe that these are people who have long led the democracy movement and Beijing was uh, you know, encouraging perhaps the local police and others uh, to take advantage now of the climate we have under the national security law to uh, prosecute these uh, very uh, famous and highly regarded uh, democracy activists. So, so this is kind of what sort of the prelude to this past year, uh, last year in the, uh, in, on June 30th, the national security law was therefore imposed on Hong Kong. And it's striking that this law was imposed on Hong Kong because the basic law itself said that Hong Kong shall enact laws on various topics of national security, secrecy, sedition, subversion, and so on, on its own. Uh, and uh, the Hong Kong government attempted to do that in 2003, but proposed a law that was kind of draconian uh, and Hong Kong people again took to the streets and protested against it. Uh, I was actually a member of the Article 23 concern group that, that uh, put out a lot of pamphlets and so on to help educate the public on concerns that we had at the time. Uh, there are half a million protesters that year took to the streets and the national security proposal was withdrawn. It was never put forward again. Now, if the Hong Kong government had put forward a national security law under Article 23 that conformed to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which also applies in Hong Kong, I think there would have been uh, no problem that this law would have been enacted. But as it was, the government never did that. And so Beijing says, well, you didn't do it, we're going to do it. And the national security law it has been, of course, a topic of much discussion, and it's also a topic of enforcement. I think about 98 people now have been arrested under the national security law. I'll just go through a little bit of it in the time we have here to highlight some of the problems. I think some of the biggest problems is that it really, a lot of people think the biggest problem are that it has four pro prohibitions against uh, secession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. And these are poorly defined and therefore they, they violate especially freedom of expression. And that is a major problem with the national security law, but it's not where it ends. The bigger problem actually is Beijing's intrusion into Hong Kong under the national security law. The, the law, first it was enacted without any consultation with Hong Kong people. Uh, and then uh, it was, implemented, it was uh, promulgated as they, they use that term uh, under uh, Article 18 of the Basic Law at 11 p.m. on June 30th last year. Uh, then on July 1st, when protests were already planned in Hong Kong, the sort of annual protest that occurs on the, the day of the handover uh, in 1997, every year on July 1st, uh, 10 people were already arrested. And the police started targeting, just putting up signs like five, you know, the demands made the previous year were five of them, five demands, no less, suddenly becomes a violation. Uh, having a sign like that or carrying a sign like that, revolution of our times, another one that they opposed. All these kinds of signs were targeted and 10 people were arrested immediately. So this law imposed without any notice to the public was being used rather aggressively immediately. But what I think was some of the areas that I particularly address in the book and that concern me the most is one is that a special committee on safeguarding national security is created. And this is headed by the chief executive of Hong Kong, who is not widely properly elected by the people of Hong Kong, but selected by a very Beijing friendly committee. She heads this and her cabinet makes up the committee. Uh, and she is advised by a national security advisor. And, and that national security advisor is a mainland official. The committee itself is made directly answerable to the central people's government. So the existence of the committee offends uh, the autonomy of Hong Kong, the high degree of autonomy that was promised. Uh, and it's answerable to the central government uh, and it is not subject to judicial review. So one of the key planks of Hong Kong's rule of law system that, that public officials, no one is above the law, everyone is subject to the law, is offended by the idea that judicial review does not apply to the committee and the committee can issue regulations. In fact, its very first act was to issue a series of regulations 
on how the police would carry out their duties under the national security law. And he gave the police the power to, to conduct searches without warrants, to conduct surveillance without that. And the police and the committee itself all operate in secret. So there's a kind of secret police created. So if this committee were the only thing, it would be bad enough. But the, the national security law goes on then to create an office on safeguarding national security. And this office is made up entirely of mainland uh, officials from the, the national public security uh, authorities. And they are then to be based in Hong Kong and they're given the power also to conduct investigations. And they're supposed to oversee the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong. So this, uh, of course, means that the autonomy is virtually destroyed. Uh, and many people in Hong Kong take the view that one country, two systems is dead. Uh, the US government also takes this view that it's withdrawn its special recognition of Hong Kong, uh, which, it, which was the case that, that existed after the handover and over the many years up until 2020 when the national security law was enacted. So this uh, uh, office for safeguarding national security also has a lot of powers. And, and one of the, the more concerning ones is that if uh, it judges a case that it comes up, it discovers or it, it, where they're going to make charges or where they are, a case they're investigating, if they think it is complex or serious, it can transfer the case to the mainland, okay? Uh, and the person then who's arrested would be tried in mainland courts and under the standards of practice that occur there, which really do not adhere much to uh, uh, the human rights guarantees and so on, uh, and the rule of law as applied in Hong Kong. So, so this office is, is of course, a, a great, great concern to people in Hong Kong. And so when we have these institutions overseeing national security, and I should say the mainland office is not even subject to local jurisdiction, then you can imagine that those four prohibitions, those four laws, four crimes that are created under the national security raise real problems for Hong Kong people because they don't know what, if those laws are vague, they don't know what is prohibited and what is permitted. And that has been the case. So people arrested under this law uh, also face other constraints that, that, they, uh, that are really hard to predict. One is uh, that the national security law creates a special list of judges who can hear the cases. Not all Hong Kong judges can hear the case. And, and under the provisions uh, on this list, if a judge is on the list and he is in a, in a separate article, it says if such judges uh, make statements in violation of national security, then they could be removed from the list. And this is, uh, of course, uh, I guess a kind of intimidation of those judges, because when do judges make such statements? Hong Kong judges, like common law judges anywhere, do not participate in politics. So if they made such a statement, it would presumably be in the court as a ruling in a case. Uh, and so uh, one would expect a judge would be very mindful and careful in this regard. And the judges have in fact faced public criticism uh, the judges of Hong Kong, even in public order cases and in cases involving bail under the national security law, they've faced public criticism when their rulings have not pleased either pro-Beijing uh, people in Hong Kong or mainland officials. So they've been named in mainland newspapers, the China Daily and so on, these judges when they have issued rulings uh, that doesn't please uh, the the uh, officials that are concerned with enforcing national security. So, so this is, has been a real problem in Hong Kong and the intimidation of the courts is quite widespread uh, because when these cases have come up, perhaps the most notorious case was the arrest of the, what is the publisher of the leading newspaper in Hong Kong, Jimmy Lai. Uh, this paper sells more copies than other papers. It, it's, it's kind of scandalous at times, but it's very popular among local readers and Chinese. 
Uh, the publisher of that very well-known figure, Jimmy Lai, has been arrested under the national security law. Uh, and he, uh, when he was taken in, he, we, we know he was to be charged with subversion because he spoke to the press and advocated uh, you know, that foreign governments put pressure on China regarding the national security law. Uh, there's some allegations or some uh, surmise. We really don't know all the details to support the case against him. But one of them is that he presumably uh, offered money to help put ads in foreign newspapers. So subversion and collusion are, are paired because it involves foreign governments. So under the provision on collusion, uh, a, a person in Hong Kong or anywhere in the world could uh, be the target of that charge uh, if they uh, try to uh, talk foreign governments into imposing sanctions on Hong Kong or mainland officials and so on. So uh, it sort of uh, lobbying for sanctions could be a basis for such charge. Uh, and at the same time, if you work with foreigners and you make statements that bring hatred or contempt to the Hong Kong government, the same kind of charge uh, could be involved. I mean, you could imagine even people anywhere that even th this, this seminar could be, if it's judged that what I say encourages uh, hatred or contempt of the Hong Kong government, then people could target you uh, with these kinds of uh, uh, charges. And, and of course, if you're overseas, a warrant might be issued. In fact, warrants have been issued. We're told six of the people that have been targeted with these warrants for lobbying their, their governments abroad or, or any government abroad. Uh, and, and one of them is, is an American citizen based in the United States who's named Samuel Chu, who just heads an NGO that lobbies Congress. So lobbying his own government can become a crime in Hong Kong. And we've been told a warrant has been issued against him. I, I've never seen the warrant. I don't think he has either. We're told that some 30 other warrants uh, have been issued and we don't know who they target. Uh, we, we know that two of the war other warrants target uh, young Hong Kong people who have fled abroad who are on the board of the Hong Kong Democracy Council. Uh, which is based in Washington, D.C., and that's the, the body, the NGO that Samuel Chu is the director of. So the HKDC, as it's called, has at least three warrants against it, but we don't know if other members of, of the board or others could be the target of those warrants. So, so this is, is the kind of problem uh, uh, that you have with a law that applies uh, very widely and is enforced by institutions in secret. So we have now, as I described it, both local and mainland police who are secret police. Uh, and we have these committee and, and an office uh, that operate in secret and are not subject to local court review. So this, this is the basic situation. Now the law doesn't stop there. It, it directs the Hong Kong government to oversee education in Hong Kong, to oversee the media, to, uh, I guess do something, it's not explicit what they're to do uh, to make sure that students don't engage in, in, uh, in subversive activities or, or uh, publish statements that are, are prohibited uh, in the schools and so on. Uh, even a new regulation was issued by the Hong Kong Education Department that can result in teachers being fired and students being dismissed and so on. So there's a kind of chilling effect across the society. Now, I don't, I, I have a limit in time. So what I thought I could highlight is if you look at the institutions of autonomy in Hong Kong, I began by saying that the constitutional, liberal constitutional order is under challenge. It's been replaced in effect by a national security state. So the, institutions that are no longer autonomous because Beijing, more or less Beijing usually 
sort of lets out who it wants and, and all of the members or most of the members, not all of them, go along to choose the chief executive. The legislative council is another area uh, that, that's no longer able to function independently. Over the years, half of the legislators could be elected. Some of them, uh, another half would be so-called indirectly elected uh, through functional constituencies. But what happened recently is they started vetting the candidates for their patriotism. And so for uh, right before the election that was to be held late last year, uh, 12 people were disqualified. Four of them were sitting members of the Legislative Council who had been elected from the opposition camp. So they were disqualified in that election. Then right after that, that election was postponed for a year. But Soon after that, Beijing said that if the Hong Kong government wanted, they, they based, when they postponed the election for a year, I should say they extended the office holders who already were in the Legislative Council for that year, including uh, the four who had been disqualified. But then Beijing issued a statement that those four could be dismissed and the Hong Kong government did so. And then all of the opposition legislators got up and left. So the legislature is not functioning independently. We noted that now the press is under a kind of oversight by the government. Uh, and so there's, a, there's always been a kind of intimidation of the press, uh, often in the past done through money because mainland companies would not advertise in newspapers that were uh, kind of on the blacklist like the Apple Daily, the Jimmy, Jimmy Lai publishes. So what's happened now is some reporters have been arrested uh, for things they do, especially in the broadcast media, they've been arrested. Uh, so there's a kind of intimidation. So the media as an institution has been weakened. The universities have always been important in Hong Kong, but now they also have been weakened as institutions because of these education uh, oversight that's provided in the national security law. So this includes uh, the regulations for the secondary and primary schools that I mentioned already, but also at the university level, I think there's a sense now that it's very hazardous for university professors to speak up openly on contentious issues <clears throat> where they could be branded. Now, one of my colleagues at Hong Kong U has, was dismissed from his position and he's also been prosecuted. That's Benny Tai. He was the organizer of the so-called umbrella movement in 2014 and 15. So he's being charged with a public order offense. But it, that kind of firing of, of a professor has a chilling effect. Beijing and the Hong Kong government knows they don't have to, to arrest everybody. They just have to uh, target people. So that, that effect is there. Uh, public protests have been largely silenced and it doesn't hurt if you arrested 10,000 people, that sends a very clear message. Prosecuting of uh, leaders like these traditional democracy leaders, uh, you know, the 15 that's on trial right now, that becomes a problem. So all of these things are going on, all of these institutions now uh, have been weakened. So this is why I would suggest this is a kind of textbook case if you're running an open society. And this is not just any open society. I mean, this is perhaps one of the top three cities in the world. If you think of the major financial and cultural centers of the world, London, New York, Hong Kong, it certainly has a, is a candidate for that list. So if you imagine a city of that uh, nature uh, with a very uh, successful, uh, well-off society being suppressed, well, this is, is the case of it. So in some ways, it's more than the usual authoritarian uh, shutdown that you might see as, as we are now seeing in Myanmar, uh, but it's reaching uh, a, a lot of places in the world because so much wealth and, and culture and other things of this nature pass through Hong Kong. And so uh, it's disabling Hong Kong may come at a huge price uh, for the world at large. I think in some ways, uh, some people uh, used to say, well, we're all Berliners. Now I think we're all Hong Kongers. And I'll close with that. There's a number of other topics that some of you will have come across in the media and so on. Things like uh, disputes over bail and so on that I haven't gone into yet, but we could go into it in discussion. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you so much, um, Michael. That was a fascinating talk and if not incredibly depressing. Um, but we have a great set of questions so far. Again, to the people in the audience, if you'd like to unmute to ask your question, especially to Stanford affiliates, you have to let me know. Otherwise there's like a difficult mechanism for me to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and start with a question from Larry Diamond. Is there any prospect of arresting this slide to full authoritarianism in Hong Kong? How far can it go? And is there anything that Asian and Western democracies can do to restrain the authoritarian trend that you've outlined? I think there's sort of two answers and both of them are on very weak legs, Larry. Uh, one answer is something like we're seeing in Myanmar. Uh, is it likely that Hong Kong street is going to be reactivated? I don't dismiss this entirely even though the threat to people participating in protest is so large. I've watched over many years, as you know, I've been in Hong Kong. I was a professor at the University of Hong Kong for over two decades. Uh, and I've watched the street come to life more than once. So, and it's interesting, that's happened in China as well a few times over those years. So uh, I don't think we can dismiss entirely that if this goes on, and these heavy handed tactics continue that at some point there may be a response locally on the street in Hong Kong. And, and I think the world has to watch this very carefully uh, because if it happens, there'll probably be a lot of arrest. Uh, it will have been done on some kind of popular judgment that there's no alternative that I think we're seeing something like that unfold in Myanmar today uh, in the face of very similar kinds of threat. Uh, if that's not the way out, then the way out that, that's been evolving uh, and not uh, mere speculation has been foreign criticism of China's policies in Hong Kong. And there's targeted sanctioning going on in regard to that. Uh, and then along with that has been immigration uh, the relaxation of immigration controls so that Hong Kong people could leave. Uh, and so these are, are forms of imposing cost on China for what it's doing in Hong Kong. Uh, as in Myanmar, the Beijing government likes to claim that it's not doing, that it's upholding the basic law uh, even uh, in Myanmar, we've heard these kinds of statements coming out of the military. Uh, so I hate to draw a parallel. I never thought I would draw a parallel between Myanmar and Hong Kong, but there's a lot of similarity going on that, that's frightening. Uh, and I, I suppose the question is whether targeted sanctions, and I know Larry Diamond much more than I could, could, could comment on this a, a great deal, uh, whether target, how can targeted sanctions have an impact? Uh, that there has to be some kind of cost that, uh, you know, I'm telling officials as we're doing now that they, they can't uh, come to the United States is not going to get, get us there. It would have to be a cost that involves companies and investments and money. Uh, a lot of money passes through Hong Kong. So uh, I don't know if, you know, you don't want to impose cost on the people of Hong Kong if you can help it. So how can you uh, shape a, a sanctions regime if that's the tool you're trying to use? So these are the th questions I think foreign governments face now. I think the Biden administration is, is the new player in all of this is going to be having to assess whether this is a, an approach that they want to take and exactly what kinds of sanctions they might uh, employ to achieve this purpose. Uh, and I think this is, is a difficult question. If that's not the answer, then the other answer is allowing Hong Kong people to move uh, abroad. And the Brit British have been the most forthcoming on this. Uh, they have opened up their BNO passports, which is probably over half the population of Hong Kong under this scheme could, could wind up moving uh, to Britain. Now they probably won't all do that, but there's going to be a lot done that. I heard a report this morning of 5,000 have already applied for the special visas that Britain is offering. So this is something else that's going to, uh, I think, grow. The US has a bill in Congress that would try to widen uh, the access to the United States. 
of Hong Kong immigrants. And because of what I said earlier, Hong Kong is not an underdeveloped place. It's a place uh, with a lot of people with talent uh, that economies like Brixton economy in, in the UK could use, could perhaps uh, bring some energy to, to the British economy. So uh, I think uh, there will be more of this and, and many governments will think it's worth their while. Now, it scared me recently that the, uh, I guess the, uh, the convener of, of the executive council in Hong Kong, Bernard Chan was saying, oh, we don't have to worry if Hong Kong people leave Hong Kong, we'll just bring in more mainlanders. So that's a kind of sad statement, uh, a kind of indication of some indifference, but I don't think that's really the case. I think uh, that that would be something that would cost, uh, impose cost on China. So much wealth of China passes through Hong Kong and so many people in power in China have uh, investments in Hong Kong. So uh, I think that if, if uh, a combination of immigration uh, strategies and sanctions is going to work. It's going to be a matter of targeting. Okay, so we have a lot of questions along those lines of what the business community thinks about um, the crackdown in Hong Kong, but I'm going to let Frank Fukuyama, the CDDRL director, um, ask his question now. Frank. Yeah, thank you. So this, uh, thanks for the uh, uh, great talk. This uh, follows on what you were saying at the end. Do you need political freedom to exercise economic freedom? Is there anything in Hong Kong's economic model that is going to be seriously disrupted by this uh, taking away of you know, uh, these liberal uh, freedoms that they've enjoyed? Thank you, Frank, for your question. I've, uh, of course, read your many writings many times, and I appreciate your uh, joining the seminar. Uh, I think the way this works in Hong Kong is I used to call it darkness at the edge of town. That's corruption uh, creeping across the border. So we know from China's economic growth that you can run businesses uh, and you can market goods and sell things uh, under authoritarianism. And in, in fact, that's what China's done. But I think the secret to Hong Kong's success has been as a kind of place for investment and what the message I think we're getting under the national security law and, and some companies like HSBC and, and Cathay Pacific and Standard Charter Bank have been pressured to support the national security law. OK, uh, and uh, th that means and at the same time, the governments of the countries where the, these businesses also uh, you know, are located may be passing laws and sanction regime. This is how it would work that would uh, impose a cost on companies uh, that are seen to have their fingerprints on Hong Kong's repression. So I think when you live in an environment where suddenly there are friends of the government that are allowed to operate freely and are treated well, and people that are, are not, then I think it does have a damage on the economy. Uh, the freedom that Hong Kong is famous for cannot survive a kind of corruption that rewards friends and punishes enemies. Now we see some companies are, are starting to worry about this. I'm sure a lot of lawyers are advising them on these things, but New York Times has moved a lot of its operations out of Hong Kong. So another element I think, uh, Frank, that would be present would be information, also access to information. When you start uh, repressing freedom of speech, where do you stop? How do you control what people see in, an, in, in a society in general? And in particular, how do you do that in an open society? So do you, and do, does this repression create incentives for people to leave Hong Kong? Uh, and it may not be that, you know, the businessman down the street packs his bags and closes his business. It could be that he sends his children abroad to do it. So I think there is a cost. I would like to hear your views on it as well. <laughs> um, we have plenty of other questions uh, uh, sort of along these lines as well. So people are noting that if there are relaxed immigration um, procedures from other countries, isn't it in mainland China's interest to then send you know, potential troublemakers abroad and move mainlanders in as you suggested the law allows for? Would that give China a sort of workaround? I think that, that that's been done already. They, there's always, ever since way back, I guess in night, uh, uh, 
it was 1999 when they they started the the there was a case the first case so called Ngalin case was when the government was was setting standards about who could be in Hong Kong under the basic law and at the same time issues came up then about uh, mainland immigration how, you know so at the time uh, Hong people who were trying to claim Hong Kong status via their parents were told that they could come in in an orderly process. And so this came up before the court. We need not get into the details of it, but I think over the years, there has been a lot of migration from the mainland to Hong Kong. And so I suppose this will continue. Uh, and the question becomes for Hong Kong people, whether the freedoms and so on that are attracting people to come to Hong Kong will be maintained. Uh, and it, it's a kind of a weird situation, to be honest with you, that a lot of people immigrate from China into open societies, but at the same time, they become proponents of mainland China. Uh, and so when they vote in Hong Kong, they vote for the pro-Beijing forces in Hong Kong. You would think they would do the opposite in a way that they've gotten into this open society, shouldn't they be on the other side? <laughs> but I think a lot of that is, is shaped by the way the government interacts with them. Uh, mainlanders are under pressure not to put, uh, not to support the opposition camp in Hong Kong and so on. And, and it, it's a complicated thing, but th that just immigration in general, when it comes to talent, well, Hong Kong has also been getting a lot of talent from the mainland, but it's usually talent that's trained in Hong Kong or abroad in the United States or the UK and they get the jobs in Hong Kong. So they are pretty much on board for Hong Kong's, uh, you know, sort of competitive, let's, let's put it that way, uh, with talent in Hong Kong. But all of this operates now, up until now, under a rule of law system uh, that is, uh, you know, very careful about, uh, you know, uh, holding people accountable and so on under the rule of law. What happens if that's taken away? One, will these main, the most talented mainlanders who go get their degree at Stanford, will they want to go back to Hong Kong anymore? So would, will we lower the caliber of mainlanders brought into Hong Kong as a result of lowering the caliber of Hong Kong? Okay, interesting. Um, so I'm going to group together some questions about trying to contextualize these moves in Hong Kong in a broader set of strategies that Xi Jinping is using, repressive strategies. Can you say anything more about, you know, given Xinjiang and also um, some it's potential strife between China and Taiwan, what you think, um, why now for the crackdown in Hong Kong? Why now for the national security law? And also what does this mean for, for policies in other parts of China or towards other countries? Well, it seems to mean Beijing is more assertive. This is something that we've been observing. I mean, we don't have to be in Hong Kong or China to, to notice this, that China uh, has become more active. And there's a lot of speculation about it that, that they're using the cover of the current uh, COVID crisis and other things to do, you know, when other governments abroad are preoccupied uh, to do this, I think. Some of it though, I, I, I don't wanna put it all on that. I think Xi Jinping came into power uh, from the get-go. He was pretty much uh, being more repressive, trying to silence opposition and so on. So in some ways, I think uh, uh, this is sort of the end result of it, that at first you scare a few people and then if that doesn't uh, accomplish your purpose, you expand. Uh, what you're doing. So you reach abroad, that's kind of uh, flying the flag. It's, it's a kind of encouraging a kind of nationalism. So I think once countries get on this path of trying to repress their society, there is a kind of escalation that's built into what they're doing on top of uh, responding to things as they arise. But, but Xi Jinping is clearly been playing a kind of nationalist card when it comes to his behavior in the South China Sea, on the Indian border, and I think on Hong Kong as well. Uh, and I think that they, they've been using, in, especially in Southeast Asia, I think China is uh, very present uh, and uh, in some ways promoting its way of doing business 
uh, and, and a lot of uh, uh, the kinds of things we see in Hong Kong, I think, cause concern across the region because there's a perception that, that what China is doing there, uh, if you're in bed with China for economic reasons, that these kinds of uh, people, let's just say that people with share values with China will be pushed forward in these uh, neighboring countries and uh, the region will become more and more like China. So I think this is there's some kind of concerns across the region in this regard uh, but yeah I think in some ways the, the, these things are the end result of, of repression you just re, you you can't relax repression you have to repress more and more okay so I'm going to allow Erin Carter to speak um, she's a visiting scholar at CDDRL Erin Hi, thank you so much for this engaging presentation. Um, so I wanted to follow up on some of what you were saying about academic freedom in Hong Kong. Um, as you mentioned, the, the trends have not been good um, at both the primary school and the tertiary level, right? So primary school teachers have been banned from teaching for life uh, due to spreading so-called pro-independence messages in the classroom uh, at Hong Kong University, which is sort of ranked uh, one of the top 50 universities in the world. Two professors from the mainland were recently appointed to the governing council. Um, as you mentioned, Benny Tai, a well-known professor, lost his job despite having tenure. And as you mentioned, a lot of these trends are chilling for academic freedom. Um, and so what I'm curious about is what you hear among your colleagues, among the broader scholarly community in Hong Kong, how do you see this playing out, right? Do you see people leaving? Uh, do you see people changing their research? Um, I'm just curious from, from an on the ground perspective, um, what, what your take is on the direction of academic freedom in Hong Kong? Yeah, I think uh, probably the biggest concern would be recruiting new people uh, and attracting students uh, into Hong Kong. I, I think uh, if this atmosphere of where pe people have to look over their shoulder or worry about the midnight knock, if they speak up on, on public issues that displease the government, now that there's even a report overnight in Bloomberg that uh, criticizing or, 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 you know, I guess criticizing Hong Kong officials could be uh, considered an offense. So uh, I think this is such a huge contrast to the Hong Kong that I've spent my career in, where we were very much, in fact, I would say more than anyone else, the university professors were at the leading edge of almost all public debates. And so the, there was a lot of freedom to speak out on just about any issue. Even in the COVID crisis, people were speaking, uh, you know, medical uh, faculty are speaking out on, on that. Uh, but, but when it comes to Hong Kong's democracy movement and rule of law, uh, the, probably the leading source of information for the media and for the public has been universities. I remember even in the 2003 protest when I was there, I was one of the Article 23 concern group uh, reporters would ask the protesters, why are you protesting? Because, oh, they would respond, because I'm worried about freedom of expression. And then the reporter, I remember this question being asked, reporter asked the person on the street, well, why are you worried about that? Because those professors told us that we should worry about that. So I, I think it's, we shouldn't underrate the, the importance of the university professors in, in the public debate in Hong Kong. Now that's been largely silenced. There's very little, uh, you know, those who have been active literally and active on the street are, are not active on the street. But even I, my general impression is that people aren't speaking out in general. So this raises a question if you're a young faculty member or you know, want to be faculty member uh, somewhere abroad at Stanford or Yale or Harvard or wherever, whether you should take a job in Hong Kong. If you're from the mainland, and you might have in the past thought, well, I will go to Harvard or Stanford and get a PhD, and then I'll go back to Hong Kong because then I can live in an open society. Well, maybe you won't do that now. You'll be looking elsewhere. Uh, so I think this is where the impact at the tertiary level will be. <clears throat> It'll be some silencing and caution in what people say, but I think the broader impact will be down the road, and this could have a, a effect the rankings of the universities. So that's at the, at the university level. <clears throat> I think at the secondary level, it's much more dire. There, 
literally being dismissed and they're told that they can't have any of this stuff on campus. Uh, now, all across the board, the, the, the schools themselves are issuing various kinds of rules and directives as well. Uh, and so the Chinese university has, has issued some kind of directive about people not doing certain things that would violate uh, you know, these national security law. So I think a lot of the students, whether it's secondary or tertiary, don't really know what violates the national security law. So again, you're going to have a kind of silencing of people unless as one of the scenarios I responded to Larry with is that they at some point say, no, we're just going to go back to the street. But right now that's not happening. And, and I think everyone's been silenced and, and I expect a kind of uh, degrading of, of uh, the universities and the secondary schools as a result. Um, so to go back to a topic earlier that you were discussing about Hong Kong as an international financial center, we have questions from Michael McFall and Tom Finger, both of whom are senior fellows at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford, asking how businessmen and the business community are reacting um, and what their expectations are for the future. You indicated that there's going to be a chilling effect for educational institutions. What do you see happening for Hong Kong's sort of economic future as a result of all of this? From the well, I think in, in part to uh, Francis Fukuyama's uh, question is I, I sort of raised what, what my concern is, uh, and, and that is I, I see pressure on businesses to go along with the government, to support the government on all of this. Now, historically, we know the, the, the establishment camp, the business community has been more or less supportive of the Hong Kong government. And the opposition camp has not been populated by the business uh, elites. Uh, but I think these businessmen were looking at a Hong Kong where at least they could, you know, sort of the Hong Kong we had, one where, where the government is not democratic, but at the same time, liberal institutions and the rule of law were maintained. Uh, they're not looking at that now. That, that's changing. Now, some of the interviews I did in 2019, that's long before the national security law, I found businessmen who I couldn't quote, I can only refer to anonymously in the book, uh, very, very prominent businessmen who were very concerned and somewhat sympathetic to the protesters. They didn't like the tactics the protesters were using, but they were very concerned about the heavy handed style and the increased Beijing interference in Hong Kong. The problem is with the pressures that's on them to support the government, support the establishment, they're not speaking out. They spoke out a little bit in 2019 because of this extradition law would have reached them and that they persuaded the government to revise it slightly because uh, it had nine, I think, changes in it because of businessmen's concern. Uh, and at the same time in 2019, you would see younger members of the business community downtown actually joining the protest. So we, we should not assume that the business elites are sort of uniformly behind the government, even if they're not speaking up. So what will they do? I suppose if they feel that the, the, the former level playing field is no longer level uh, and that some people are advantaged over others, and in particular, I would assume that evolution would mean mainland companies are more advantaged, we may see, see people moving. Uh, there have been concerns, and, and I, you know, at this point, I don't really know uh, how well developed these uh, ideas are that, that business companies that have regional headquarters in Hong Kong will move to Singapore or elsewhere, uh, Tokyo, another uh, open market society somewhere. Uh, whether this is, is developing, it's not really clear at this point, but it's certainly, I think there, there is cause for concern because there's a reason why uh, these regional offices have been located in Hong Kong. It, it really does matter that the rule of law is maintained and it's hard to maintain the rule of law when you have so many uh, public officials and police officers operating without uh, oversight. Um, so a question from Eric Jensen at CDBRL. Is there any prospective room for negotiation to ameliorate the effects of this law? For example, making the national security apparatus subject to judicial review. And is there any effort to try to negotiate something along those lines? 
Well, the government claims that it is. It's just that these things are done in secret and the committee is not subject to review, but the rest goes into courts. But then at the same time, the courts are, are under all this pressure and judges who rule in ways that government uh, or the establishment or Beijing officials do not like are uh, literally subject to open criticism. So there's a lot of pressure there. Uh, during, uh, there, there was a bail hearing for Jimmy Lai uh, at the when he was, uh, when this was being considered, he had been uh, denied bail by a magistrate and then a high court judge, Alex Lee, had granted him bail under very stringent conditions where he was to remain at home and so on. And then uh, this was appealed to the Court of Final Appeal and the Court of Final Appeal uh, put him back in jail. Uh, but during that time the appeal was pending, the People's Daily started writing articles, in fact, characterizing Jimmy Lai as a very dangerous criminal. Yeah. Uh, and in effect, his free speech crimes have branded him as if he's a murderer. Uh, and he was, by the way, footnote here, was arrested again today, allegedly uh, for supporting 12 Hong Kongers who had fled Hong Kong and they were picked up by the mainland. Uh, so he, he's now branded and it, clearly there's there some effort to get him and lock him up uh, for a long time. So these, these are the conditions uh, that exist. The, try to do something about it. Well, the new chairman of the bar, Paul Harris, had said, well, he's going to try to persuade the Hong Kong government to persuade the Beijing government to re reform the national security law to some degree. Well, Paul Harris then came under severe criticism uh, in the Chinese newspapers uh, and so on. So, so this kind of thing, uh, He's been uh, threatened. He's been told he should resign his position, and 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 this is how it goes. And the bar, by the way, is an institution, another institution I didn't mention in my list of institutions under stress. Uh, the most uh, prominent in defending. So yes. Sorry, you are breaking up a little. Um, Okay. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So yeah, th th these avenues to fix it are are there. They're being proposed, but so far they're they're landing on deaf ears. Okay. So in our final, I guess for the final question from Brett Carter, um, he's asking if you know you had suggested that popular protest may be one possibility for the future. But of course, mainly on China has a history of repressing protest and also. Uh, would be worried about demonstration effects in all likelihood. So what do you think happens in a world in which there's more popular protest? Or do you think you know you could sketch out a scenario for a successful protest movement in Hong Kong? This I feel, again, I feel I'm harking to Myanmar. <laughs> it's almost exactly the same kind of scenario where there would be massive arrest. The, the question would be whether if the protest was popular enough, in other words, almost everyone was on the street, perhaps like 2019, and perhaps uh, if it were not, there were no violence being used, if violence is used, that will give the, the regime an excuse to crack down aggressively. Then I would expect there'd probably be a lot of arrest. Uh, the, the police have shown no hesitance in arresting people but is there a kind of overload on arrest that's possible? I don't know. That, that's the question, again, we face in Myanmar is whether these people now on the street somehow will weigh down the capacity of the government to repress them uh, by their sheer numbers. So yeah, it's a very hazardous kind of scenario in a way, but it, unfortunately, sometimes in desperate situations, it's the scenario that people choose uh, whether wise or not. I can say in late 2019, when I was interviewing protesters on the streets in Hong Kong, I was being told they actually were optimistic. Uh, the rest of the world was waiting for the, the, the boom to fall on them. But they were saying, no, 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 Beijing cannot afford uh, to bring in the PLA. It can't afford to crack down in Hong Kong because it will lose too much. And so there was a lot of optimism, even expressed by some who are, I know are now in jail. Uh, so it's not unimaginable that uh, these young people in Hong Kong will judge that, that they should go ahead, that the, the alternative is 
is just not something they can live with. I don't know. Uh, I'm not encouraging it or discouraging it. I'm just observing uh, what, what I saw in late 2019 when protests were at their height and what people were saying. And now uh, in this question, wondering how they would view the situation. Right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Davis. The book is Making Hong Kong China. The information is in your chat. And thank you so much for joining us today and for discussing these critical issues facing Hong Kong. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us as well. Goodbye. Bye.